Hello, this is Dr. Paul Cottrell, and I'm going to be doing something a little bit different uh, for this video. I'm going to read a section of the Torah uh, dealing with the red heifer and give you my interpretation. Of it, all right. Um, and it's going to be heavily influenced by Rashi's uh, commentary about um, this Parsha, this section. It's in Numbers chapter 19. Okay, and we're going to start with verse one. But before we start, please uh, make sure you subscribe to all my channels. I have three channels on YouTube. I have Bright Town, Bitchu, and Rumble. Please also follow me on X and Getter. And please share the links and ask your social media to, to follow me. I need your help uh, in terms of reaching a larger audience. We're going to be going through tumultuous times that I've been warning people about for several years about the crisis, but specifically what's going on in the Middle East, uh, there's this dark cloud that started on 12-1-23. I was warning people about this uh, when I was doing some videos with Gail uh, back in September and, and August, all right? Uh, I've been also explaining my feelings as we move through this crisis in the Middle East with John Hogue, um, and I think we're going to be doing uh, episode 11 or 12 tonight. So, um, you know, stay tuned for that. So I, I've been, I'm, I'm not a newcomer to what's going on with the Middle East. All right? I've been, you know, focused on, uh, on it, especially since October 7th. But I've been warning people in, uh, in September and August uh, that there was this dark cloud that was, that was, happening to the world, but I had no idea that October 7th would be, you know, a major inflection point. Um, so with that said, let's, let's, you know, let's do something different. Okay. Um, this is going to be numbers. Okay. Uh, Jews call it Bam and Bar, but it's numbers and it's going to be chapter 19 and we're going to start with verse one okay i might be doing a few videos on this because we there this is going to be there's some deep stuff in this all right hashem spoke to moses and to aaron saying this is the statute of the torah which hashem has commanded saying speak to the children of israel and they shall take to you a perfectly red cow which has no blemish upon which a yoke has not come. All right, so the no blemish means that it can't have more than um, two hairs that are not red, all right? And then it no yoke, meaning the yoke around the neck, so it's never been a slave. Now that's important. Now think about the idea of being a slave and how that may affect you down down the road if you become free all right so there's a deeper meaning to this all right you shall give it to alazar the cohen all right so you got to remember they were going to this is the um this is during the tabernacle time period okay so alazar the cohen he shall take it to the outside of the camp. So it can't be within Jerusalem because now, you know, they've already crossed the river and they're in Jerusalem, right? Yeah. Today, right? Back, back when this was written, they were in the desert. So outside the camp and someone shall slaughter it in his presence. Okay. So it has to be a Cohen. And it, that Cohen doesn't necessarily slaughter the animal, okay, for the red heifer. And, and someone shall slaughter in his presence, okay? Now, when you look at the Hebrew in this, Rashi, okay, I'm reading, I'm reading common, common, the, the common, the, um, the interpretation from Rashi, it's going to be, and someone literally means, and he, when you look at it in Hebrew, 
and someone, so it's and he, shall slaughter it in the presence. Okay, so that basically means that it's a, a non-Cohen may slaughter and and Elazar watches. So a Cohen has to watch and this person that's doing the slaughtering doesn't have to be a Cohen. Before I read this more deeply, um, I thought it had to be a Cohen, but that's not the case. A Cohen has to watch and someone pure has to do it. Okay. And think about the deepness of this. Perhaps there is a Cohen that isn't pure because they've, they've had, they've been exposed to a dead, dead corp, corpse. All right. They wouldn't be able to do the slaughter. So this is like a safeguard to be able that, that it could be a Cohen that does the slaughtering, but doesn't have to be, all right? So Lazar, the Cohen, shall take some of its blood with his forefinger and sprinkle some of its blood toward the front of the tent of meeting seven times, okay? So by slaughtering the animal, it seems as though there is a, a, a there is a, um, a, um, you have to be pure, right? And by slaughtering the animal, which is most likely in the north side of the, the altar, when slaughtering the animal, that individual is, that becomes impure. So this person who may not be a Cohen becomes impure. And the Cohen that takes the blood eventually becomes impure. All right. And the one that's watching is doing the, the, the spring of the blood, all right, towards the, the tent of meeting. But this was back during the tabernacle days. This means that the blood will be sprinkled towards the temple mount. So the altar is outside the camp, outside away from, you know, away from the temple area on Mount Olive in our day, all right? That altar, when the animal is sacrificed, most likely the animal will be sacrificed on the north side of the altar. That's my understanding. And that what will happen is, is then a Cohen, a different person that's watching this, will take the blood from the slaughter of the red heifer and sprinkle it towards the Temple Mount. Okay. So Elazar the Cohen shall take some of its blood with his forefinger and sprinkle some of its blood toward the front of the tent of meeting seven times. So he's going to sprinkle towards the Temple Mount seven times. Someone shall burn the cow before his eyes, its hide and its flesh and its blood with its waste shall he burn. Now, there's no comp, there's no, there's no interpretation by Rashi that if it's a different person or if it's the same person that slaughtered. It seems to me that it's a different person. Okay. So you have the one that slaughters, you have a Cohen that's watching the slaughtering. The Cohen takes the blood from the slaughter, sprinkles it seven times towards the the Temple Mount, and then another person will take the, the, the animal in its hide, and my understanding, there's pieces of it that's cut up, all right, and it's put onto the altar by someone else, all right? Now, so someone shall burn the cow before his eyes. So in front of the Cohen, all right? It's hide in its flesh and its blood with its waste. Shall he burn? So everything, okay? The Cohen shall take cedar wood. So now the Cohen is taking cedar wood and hasap and a crimson tongue of wool and he shall throw them into the burning of the cow. All right, so he's, he's throwing cedar wood, 
the hasa and the crimson wool on the fire. Okay, so we've had three people that are involved in this right now. The Kohen shall, um, now this is where they're, now they're impure and this is how they purify themselves. Okay, the Kohen shall immerse his clothing and immerse his flesh in water. So they're going into the mikvah. And afterwards, he may enter into the camp and the Kohen shall be impure until evening. So he goes into the mikvah, but he's not fully pure until evening. This makes it sound like the, all, the, the sacrifice has to be taking place in the morning or the mid-afternoon. Okay. The one who burns it shall immerse his clothing and immerse his flesh in water. Okay. So this is the, this is the person that put it up on the ark and was burning it. The one who burns it shall immerse his clothing and immerse his flesh in water. And he shall be impure until evening. Same issue with the Kohen. So the Kohen and the person that was doing the burning. Now, is it possible that the one that did the slaughter is the one that does the burning? That's possible. There's no commentary from Rashi about that. So do we have two people or do we have three people? Okay. okay. The one who burns it shall immerse his clothing and immerse his flesh in water, and he shall be impure until evening. A pure man, okay, a pure man shall gather the ash of the cow and place it outside the camp. So this is where the burn, the, 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 it, it's taking place, it's burning. It's going to take all night. So when this is done, someone is going up to collect the ash and take it and, and place it outside of where it was burned. So in this case, it would be Mount Olive. All right. It's take, they're taking the ash outside of Mount Olive and a pure man. So nine here, um, Rashi is Rashi makes the the comment the comments uh, uh, you know about and place it outside the camp. He would divide it into three parts. One part he would put on the on the Mount of Olive. I'm sorry. He phrases it as one part he put on Mount of Oil, which is also called Mount of Olives because the oil is coming from olives. And one part was divided among all the watch, watches. And one part he put in a chal, 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 chal. Okay, no, what is that? I don't know what that is. Was the area, the chal, the chal was the area immediately outside the wall of the courtyard. Now the watches, the Kohen were divided into 24 family groups called watches. These watches officiated the best of Mik Mikdash, one watch per week according to a fixed rotation. So this is the Kohenim. So he would divide it into three parts. So the, all right. So, there's a lot going on in this one sentence. A pure man shall gather the ash of the cow and place it outside the camp in a pure place. It shall be for the assembly of Israel as a safekeeping for water of sprinkling. It is a purifier. Okay. All right. So when you break that down, Rashi's commentary is that we the place that's outside the camp he would divide it into three parts so he's taken the ash and dividing into three parts i don't know if it's equally parted or not probably equally parted one part he would put on mount of oil which is interpreted as mount olive because the olives create the oil 
and one part was divided among all the watches. So there's one third is going given to all the koanim. And then one part he would put in the chayal. And that is the area immediately outside the wall of the courtyard of the Besid Middash. This part of watches was kept outside the courtyard. And so that townspeople and all who needed to be purified should be taken from it. Okay, so it seems to me that the third that's going to the watches It's interesting that they say watches and not watchers. I don't know why that is, but but they 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 um, that is the um, that is the amount that's going to purify the people. And this part and this part that was on Mount of Oil, Kohanim Gadolim. That's like the high. Cohen would sanctify themselves from it for performing the procedure of burning other red cows. So there's going to be a, the the amount of oil or Mount Olive. That amount, that one third amount, is going in the Cohen Gadolim. Now, what about? What about the Chayel? And this part that was in the Chayel was put there as a safekeeping by decree of scripture. It shall be for the assembly of Israel as a, as a safekeeping, probably because of, um, as a backstop, if, if the Kohen Gondolim runs out of ash or if the watches runs out of ash. So it's probably to see to, 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 it's a savings. Okay. So let's backtrack and, and, and go through what we just went through here. All right. In chapter 19, verse one, we are talking about the red cow and that it has to be non-blemished and there's no yoke. Then there's the Cohen that will watch over a slaughter. Someone who doesn't have to be Cohen can slaughter the, the animal. Now, most likely that person that's slaughtering the animal, I, I don't believe, I, my understanding is, is that they have to be away from a, a corpse they've never they've never been in front of a corpse before i believe a human corpse i'm not so sure about any other animal corpse now okay so you have the slaughtering that takes place most likely in the northern part of the altar and then uh the blood is sprinkled seven times towards the temple mount on mount olive or if you read the Hebrew directly, it's mouth of oil. And then someone shall burn the cow before his eyes. Now, you can interpret that someone to be the same person that did the slaughtering or some other person. So are we dealing with three people or two people? The Cohen that's watching the slaughterer now is the, is the person that's slaughtering that doesn't have to be a Cohen. Is he also burning the animal on the altar? Or is it a different person? The Cohen shall immerse his clothing. All right, so after the Cohen sees all this and does the sprinkling, he has to immerse his clothing and he has to immerse in the mikvah. And he's not pure until nightfall. Same thing with the person that burned it. They don't say anything about the person that slaughtered. So the interpretation because of this is, is that most likely 
the person that slaughtered is the person that actually burned the animal. A pure man shall gather the ash. So they would this interpretation here, a pure man could be a different person or the two people or three people that participated in the ritual because now they're they're purified. Remember, they're they're pure, they're impure until evening. So this thing's burning over a 24 hour period. The people that slaughtered, the people that burned, the people that that watched, right? The person that watched, they are impure. They go into the mikvah with their clothing. You know, their clothing is is immersed. Their body is immersed with nothing on them. They're in that mikvah, and then what happens is they're they'll become pure by nightfall. Okay, as this is happening, the cow is burning on the altar. All right. It becomes morning and it's ash now. Okay. Now, a pure man, so it could be the people that went into the mikvah and became pure, pure by nightfall, the same people, or it could be someone totally different. A pure man shall gather the ash of the cow and place it outside the camp and it shall, it, wait, and place it outside the camp in a pure place. It shall be for the assembly of Israel a safekeeping for water of sprinkling. It is a purifier. One who gathers the ash of the cow shall immerse his clothing and be impure until evening. Okay, so it's the same thing. Once you touch it, you become impure. Okay, so it's it's a pure thing. It's a thing that makes you pure, but in preparing this, in its different facets, it makes you impure. And the places that it's going, it's going to be divided into three parts. It's going to be given, it's going to be placed on Mount Olive. It's going to be given to the Cohen's. And another third is going to be given to the head Cohen, the, 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 the uh, Cohen name Gedolam. The one who gathers the ash of the cow shall immerse his clothing and be impure until evening. It shall be for the children of Israel and for the, the, the convert who dwells among them as an eternal statue. Okay. And then if you touch, then it goes, and I'll do another video on this, but then it goes, if you touch a corpse, what you would do with the, the, the ash from the red heifer. Okay. So, Let's step back and what did we learn from this? There seems to be minimum two people involved, all right? You have someone that is overseeing, watching, that's a Cohen. And you have someone that could be a Cohen or a non-Cohen that is actually slaughtering the animal. Most likely both of these people would not have been um, by a dead corpse because we don't have any ash to purify them before the slaughter of the red cow. See, back in the olden days, they had a little bit of ash from a previous red cow. They would purify the Cohen or whoever was going to be doing the slaughtering, and then they would they're they're okay, and then they can do the purification. We don't have that anymore, so we're starting from ground zero. We're starting baseline again. Well, to do baseline, you have to find someone that has never been by a corpse. So it looks like either two or three people that's never been by a corpse. And at least one of them has to be, seems to need to be a Cohen, all right? But because he's not doing the slaughtering, he's only touching the blood, I'm not sure if he actually has to be pure or not. I'm not sure. It's, it's left for interpretation here, all right? And this is just what's in the Torah. This is not the oral tradition part of it. And I don't know where to find that in the Talmud, all right? I'm sure it's written somewhere. I just don't know what tractates and because there's many tractates and it would be, be difficult to find it um, without doing, you know, extensive research on this. But so you have a Cohen, you have a slaughterer, and you have someone that is burning 
and you have someone that is picking up the ash. At minimum, it looks like two people. All right. Max, you can might even have as many as four. All right. So you do this, you do the slaughter, the Cohen is watching, it, the slaughterer is either a Cohen or it doesn't have to be a Cohen. And the, the sprinkling of the blood seven times towards the base of the dish, towards the Temple Mount. This is all happening on Mount Olive or Mount Oil. And when this happens, then the a person, maybe the slaughterer, maybe a different person, puts the cow up on the altar. And it's starting to burn. Then the cone that was observing puts cedar wood, the crimson wool, and the hassop, a uh, hysop, uh, uh, on the fire. Now the cone and the ones that were involved in the burning have to immerse. It doesn't state that the person that did the slaughtering has to immerse. So it gives you the interpretation that the person that actually did the slaughtering is most likely the same person that actually burned the cow on the altar. So in that interpretation, it's two people. Okay. Now they immerse in the mikvah, their clothing and their 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 naked body, and then they're impure until nightfall. The cow is burning overnight. And in the morning or in the mid afternoon, when it's all ash, right? Someone that's pure, which could be these two individuals or someone else, goes up and ends up collecting the ash. And there's going to be this ash is going to be divided into three parts. One part is going to the, the coin named Gadolim. Another part is going to the watches, which are the the Cohen, the the families that will be part of the temple, and and for the temple service, and then another part will be for safekeeping, that will be um, on the side of the base of Migdash. All right, so this is going to be by the Temple Mount in in our day. All right. So, and then once that person collects that ash, they have to immerse in the mikvah, wait until nightfall, and then they're pure again. All right. So that's what is going to, that's what's going to have to transpire. Now, what do we know right now? There were five cows that were transported from Texas to the West Bank. All right. There is an organization called Temple Institute that has been making the Certain vessels, I don't know which vessels they've made. Uh, I've heard that they've made 70 vessels for the temple. And they are the ones that are taking care of the animals and making sure that they stay kosher. All right. And so they're under like 24 hour surveillance, right? These cows are really important. <laughs> so there are five. My understanding is, is that out of the five, one of them became um uh not kosher because it has more than two hairs that are not red so four are still as of like a couple days ago four are still good all right the slaughtering has to take place and it doesn't state in in this parsha but it, 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 the slaughtering from the oral traditions, it has to be in between three to five years, all right? But the longer you wait, the more chance of you having a problem. Since we don't have any ash, I think that they're going to try to minimize the amount of time that they're going to allow to elapse before they slaughter the animals. So it's got to be soon. Now, when can they do this? Well, they can do it right now all the way, you know, probably into 
the beginning of 2025. But there are some like key points here. Last year on Simpkis Torah, there was the attack. But we couldn't blow the shofar during Rosh Hashanah last year on the first day because it was on the Shabbos. So this year, we can blow the shofar. So there's going to be special strength this year, especially if you do the slaughtering right before Rosh Hashanah. Well, that's before October 3rd. There's also, you know, the benefit of slaughtering the animals before Passover because you don't have to wait until October because all four of them may become unkosher by then. So maybe at least one uh, would have to be slaughtered before that time. And uh, uh, an oppor opportune time would be right before Passover. Now, after Passover, there's the counting of the Omar, which is, you know, a 50-day count. So this count, I don't know if you can slaughter the cow during the Omar. Now, maybe you can, but I don't know if you can. I, mean, I, I don't know. It just seems that it's better off to either slaughter it after the 50-day count for the Omar than, than you know, um, during. But you might be able to, to, and maybe there's some Kabbalistic reason why it should be. So I am seeing this, and I'm not a Torah scholar by any means, but I know a little bit, all right? It seems to me that it's going to be happening before Passover, so before April 22nd. Or if there's some Kabbalistic reason that I don't know on why it should be slaughtered during the Omar, it would be after Passover during the 50-day count. Or it would be slaughtered before Rosh Hashanah, which would be before October 3rd. Now, there are four animals, so maybe they'll do this in, in piecemeal. In addition, they haven't, you know, they haven't slaughtered a red heifer in a long, long, long time, over 2,000 years, all right? So there's some nuance that we didn't even cover that, these people that are going to be participating, these two people or three people or four people, whoever, and then the the watches and the, the Cohen named Gadolim, uh, the Cohen named Gadolim, all of these people have to like learn what they have to do because this hasn't been in place for the last 2000 years. So there may be like a simulation run that's taking place, right? Because if this person can, has, you have to remember this has, they have to slaughter the animal perfectly, perfectly. It can't have any, the, the, the intent of the slaughterer has to be correct in their mind. And the way they, they cut the trachea and the esophagus has to be in, 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 in a perfect way. It, because if it's not, then it's it's invalid sacrifice. So the person that's slaughtering, my understanding is going to be young. It's about 15 year old that that falls into this category where they weren't by a dead body, right? So now maybe this person isn't going to be doing the slaughtering. Maybe he'll be collecting the ash. You know, like I said, there's four people, so I, or if, four or two people. I'm not sure. It depends on the interpretation. Minimum maybe. Two maximum, maybe four. So maybe the, the, you know there's a leeway, but there's going to be a group of people that have to practice what they need to do when, and it has to be all perfect, or we got a problem. So they're probably going to slaughter, or at least try to slaughter one animal and not all the animals at the same time, just in case they make a mistake. All right. Then. Um, then this ash is collected and then it's you know going to be distributed and it's going to be waiting for the, the this is going to start the countdown for the temple mount to be rebuilt all right some other things have to happen that are you know messianic in a way but 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 this starts it all right so you have the the ash that's going to be put for safekeeping 
and then you're going to have ash that's given to the the Cohen Godome, and then you're going to have ash that's given to the watches, and and the watches are the the, the Cohen that will be purifying the people, all right, the Jewish people. Now, once that all happens. And the Kohen, the, the Kohen Gadolim, I believe, uses their ash to actually purify the actual objects they'll be going into the temple. All right. Now, and themselves as they're doing their, their, their service in the Holy of Holies. So, so this is, you know, a larger orchestrated thing. It's not just slaughtering the animal and just burning the ash. There's a lot more going on, a lot more, you know, with the dividing of the parts. And I'm willing to bet that you've never heard this before, about the dividing of the parts and all that, because it's not written in, it's, it's part of the oral tradition and in reading the meaning of the Hebrew words in a certain way based on the, the commentary of Rashi, all right? So, you know, so there's a lot, there's a lot of nuance. And we didn't even dive into, like, the other oral tradition of what was going on with the red cow that's in the, the Talmud. I, I don't know. I don't I never read it. I don't know where to even look, but there's more to it. All right. There is also a Kabbalistic thing that's going on with the, um, the eclipse. All right. Back in early time, all right, Kabbalistically, the sun and the moon were equal in, in power. What they mean, spiritual power. But over time, the moon is diminished. Now, the moon represents, depending on the context, the moon represents basically the Jewish people. And the sun represents the rest of the people. But the, in the Zohar, it also talks about the sun and the moon, and Moses actually represents the sun, and the, the moon represents Joshua. So it depends on the context you're looking at. But if you're looking at the Jewish people compared to non-Jewish people, the sun is more powerful than the moon, and the moon represents the Jewish people. But when you have the eclipse, there is actually a negation of the sun, and I, it, there, there's a there's a, at at a, at a one instant the moon is very powerful, all right, and then as the eclipse starts to abate, then the moon starts to lose its power, all right. So from a kabbalistic point of view, there is a moment in time where the moon is actually more powerful than the sun at that perfect eclipse point. Now, this is not, a, my understanding, it's not a perfect eclipse because there's a little bit of a ring of the sun. But um, the moon is gonna be much more powerful at an instant than usually in relative terms to the sun. And this goes back to this ebb and flow between Esau and Jacob and their soul roots. So the soul root of Jacob with the sun on April 8th is going to be strong. There is a case Kabbalistically to slaughter the animals during that time period because that's the strengthening of the moon, the, the, the strengthening of the Jewish people, the soul root of Jacob, and the weakening of the, the other side, which is the soul root of Esau. All right. So it could happen on Monday. There is a cape, but for them to be able to slaughter the animal and do all this exactly at the moment of the, of the eclipse, and no one has done this since 2,000 years, it's adding to chance of failure, adding to the probability that there may be some mistake that's happening and, the, and this cow is no longer valid, all right? Because you can have a pure cow, but if the process something happens it can invalidate the whole service and everything has to you know start over with another cow so it has to be perfect so would they try to time it perfectly with the with the eclipse i don't think so and not only that 
we have to go back to, you know, this eclipse, you know, when is it? Is it during the day? Then it's more near the more nighttime in Israel. It's supposed to be slaughtered in the morning or early afternoon, you know, so the, the, the Cohen and the ones that participated are immersed in the mikvah and then at nightfall they become pure. They're not going to slaughter it at night. So, you know, so there's, there's some timing issues because of um, immersion in the mikvah. All right. So the chances of it getting right at the exact moment for the eclipse, right. As it's coming across the United States and it crosses over Texas, which is interesting. Um, it, you know, it, it, they probably can't time it exact. Now they may say, because it's an eclipse, you know, we're going to do it in the morning, um, in Israel. That's bef my understanding is that's before the eclipse. They might, they might do it, but I don't think they can do it exactly on the eclipse. That point where the moon is right in front of the sun, right? That, that I, you know, I, don't think that that's possible so um i think it causes a bunch of complications in terms of timing in terms of mikvah immersion all this stuff so it, it's possible that they they do it on the day of the eclipse but not on the exact moment of the eclipse i think it's more probable that it's going to be before april 22nd not on the eclipse and that the eclipse is kind of like a signal to, to do it um, but who knows? Now, I remember reading a passage in the Zohar, and I, there is a the passage, in, there is a, a longer passage in the Zohar about the red heifer, but I r read about uh, a sign in the sky that, that lasted for, I think, 70 days. Now, this eclipse isn't lasting for 70 days, so, and it was supposed to be over, over Rome, not over Texas. So, I mean, there's, you know, that doesn't even kind of fit, right? So that, but that was the, that countdown, that 70 day countdown was the, the actual countdown for the messianic era to literally start or, you know, that, that it, that's happened. Um, but what I do know is, is that if the cows are slaughtered and everything is properly done and there's the ash that's distributed, that is the countdown for the Temple Mount to be rebuilt. Now, it doesn't mean that it's gonna be rebuilt in 15 days. It doesn't mean that it's gonna be you know, built in 15 years. We don't know. But there's this, there's these things that are happening that, that are uh, gonna be life-changing, societal changing. And I, I'm concerned that there are gonna be the rabbinical class that is afraid to do this. And if they're afraid to do this, then there will be a heavy curse on Israel. And there is this battle that's happening. There is the power of Satan that's losing power and the power of good is starting to increase. But as the power of Satan and that, uh, that, that right, is, is losing, it's gonna start kicking and screaming and, and doing things as it's losing power. And as the good is rising, the individuals that are part of the good side may be afraid because of this evil inclination that takes place. There's a fear that sets in in the rabbinical class about afraid of doing, doing this because many rabbinical people are pacifists, all right? But you can see in society, there are many people that are pacifists and they aren't rabbinical or clerical. They're not part of the clergy. So, so uh, I would, you know, I'm just concerned that there's going to be a path that, that the rabbinical class will have a, a pacifist um, footing and miss the opportunity and all five cows end up becoming impure uh, because they were waiting, 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 waiting. And there is... There are sections of the Torah that state, you know, sometimes you just have to do and stop praying. And I think the rabbinical class needs to really take that home and, and you know, uh, you know, focus on doing and not, you know, praying so much. 
what was the lesson learned from this? Well, you can't just be a keyboard warrior. You have to engage. You can't just pray. You can't just pray and think that everything's going to be, you know, great. You have to be engaged in, in, and do positive social change. Uh, and you, you know, you can't just keyboard warrior can be just a keyboard where you have to be an engaged citizen. You have to do positive social change, right? And this is why I keep on saying that, you know, talk is great, but, uh, you know, at least the crisis that we went through in 2020, all the way, you know, through the aftershock of the crisis, this information, this, this keyboard warning type stuff that was going on in 2020 didn't stop it. It didn't get to the root cause. And we still had the problem. So the informational war didn't work. It informed people, but it didn't stop anything. It didn't get to the root cause. And you got a lot of people that monetized it. And they don't really care. There are many people that need war and destruction and, 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 and this never-ending you know, keyboard worrying, thinking, oh, did you see that you know, conspiracy theory, and blah, blah, blah. Get to the root cause, solve the problem, and make the channels obsolete. If you do your job, and I'm talking to the people that, that, you know, publish a lot, you know, you know, on channels and stuff like that, that made this into a cottage industry. If you're going to do something that's actually going to save society properly, it means that you become obsolete if you do it correctly. It's similar to a nonprofit. If you want to solve world hunger, your mission should be solving world hunger and you are, you are obsolete. You no longer have the nonprofit. What happens is, is that it becomes institutionalized. So info war becomes institutionalized. Keyboard wiring becomes institutionalized. Overproduction of you know chaos and destruction becomes institutionalized. And you don't get to the root problem. We did not shut down the laboratories doing nefarious things. Therefore, there are going to be things that happen in the future that we wish never happened that would never have happened if we paid attention to people like myself and warned the public, shut down the damn labs. Now, people would say, what are you doing, Dr. Paul Cottrell? Why aren't you shutting down the lab? You know what? It takes a whole community, not any one individual. And this is the problem. You don't have, you in this whole info war, keyboard warring kind of world that we're living in, Everyone's behind the screen wanting to do something, but no one does it. No one galvanizes a group of people and, 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 and forces the government to shut down the labs, forces the government to tear down the national security state. People aren't willing to, to galvanize. So what you'll have is martyrs out there that destroy their career or their reputation, trying to do the right thing for mankind. But uh, the keyboard warriors, uh, you know, they don't do anything. They just sit on their, their, their fat ass and, and watch football or monetize a crisis. See, the problem here is, is you get to the root cause and you no longer have the problem. But what you have is people like Alex Jones and many others that they get wealthy based on this crisis. Why would they want to solve the problem? They're wealthy from it. But people buy into it. People buy into it. There is the problem. So we go through this purification process with, you know, with the red heifer to try to, you know, reboot the temple and and get mankind more spiritual and more, you know, more in tune with God and make a, the world a better place. Right. But what you have is a group of people out there that are trying to demonize what actually is happening. They're trying to demonize the rebooting of the temple. They're trying to demonize the red heifer sacrifices. They're trying to demonize the actual um, um, rebooting and, and the, the ushering in of a messianic era. We're, there's peace on this earth and prosperity for everybody. So, you know, pay attention. If you are giving money to a nonprofit, all right, and their mission isn't to become obsolete, you're giving to the wrong nonprofit. If you're supporting someone that doesn't so, trying to solve problems, you're supporting the wrong person. 
You know, never any. Alex Jones has had 30 years of trying to solve the new world order problem and hasn't. He's got super wealthy on it, especially in the last 10 years. I mean, you know, the last 10 years, that boy was making 20 to $40 million in sales. All right. That's a lot of money. So, you know, let's just say for ease, you know, it's 30 million and, you know, for 10 years, that's $300 million worth of revenue. And he hasn't solved the new world order problem. You know what? He's part of the problem. He is part of the problem. So that's my take on it. Support people that have solutions to try to help with improving your immune system and your body and your mental health and, and your spirituality and stop supporting people that are trying to connect all dots. All dots don't connect. Don't, you know, you know, don't think that everything is a David Icke situation, but there are things that are happening in the world that are going to be societal changing. And depending on how we align ourselves, are we aligning ourselves with the soul root of Esau or the soul root of Jacob? Depends on how you're going to, you're going to fall in to the curse of the, of the blessing. Now it's up to you, but I'm not wrong on this, you know? I just don't know how long this is, you know, what's the arc of time this is all going to play out. But I do know that, you know, it's been over 2,000 years since mankind has had an opportunity where there's going to actually be the potentiality of the slaughtering of these red heifers, or at least one of them. And, you know, we have a society that is afrafraid Netanyahu's afraid to get the job done. The, the American, you know, in terms of the war in, in the Middle East, the American public is afraid of getting the job done. See, the 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 rabbinical class that's you know governing all this, you know, and orchestrating all this the, the sacrifices for the red heifers, they're afraid. They're afraid they'll screw up. They're afraid that you know this may you know create instability in the world, which it probably will in the short term. But the thing is, is God told people, don't be afraid, just do and follow and you'll be fine. It's when you get afraid and you don't do where you start getting into problems. So Netanyahu is getting a lot of pressure from the United States to, on the way he's conducting the war. And it's looking like he's backtracking. Well, that's not, that's going to be a problem for Israel in the long term. That's kicking the can down the road for some sort of political expedience in the United States. So Americans are afraid. You just take a look at just the way the Pentagon is. You know, they talk about how you know great the military is, but they can't win a war. Or, you know, how America's so great, but there's a lot of people suffering in terms of economics. There's too many people passive and not willing to engage and solve the problem and get it done. There's, you know, it's a small percentage of the population out there. So there's lots of keyboard warriors, lots of truthers that think they know everything. Think they know everything, but they don't solve the problem. Solve the problem, become obsolete. You want to listen to people that actually, literally no longer want to publish because the problem is solved and you don't have to deal with it anymore. We have the after effect of, of the crisis in 2020 through turbo cancers and, and all these other syndromes, long hauler and all this stuff, right? AIDS-like syndrome, autoimmune diseases, because we didn't solve the problem. We didn't solve the problem. We should have knocked down the labs, stopped this crazy research, this gain and function research that can be weaponized. And the ones that do it, they're held accountable and hang from a tree. But, you know, we didn't do that. We just keyboard worrying. We're only worried about, you know, X, Y, Z. We're only worried about, well, was it the inoculation? Maybe it was the force the mandates, blah, blah, blah. Well, actually it was both. It was the force mandates and the little thing that was floating in the air.
didn't solve the problem. So now we have the aftershock of it. The same thing with the Middle East. Don't solve the problem, there'll be an aftershock. It'll be worse. You miss the opportunity for the red heifers and the rebuilding of the temple. Same thing. It's going to get worse in, in the long run. And Esau's soul root will strengthen. And believe me, you don't want that. So thank you for listening and have a nice day.